Today, as we look at the scripture passage, um, the question that I really want to ask you is, you know, once we're saved, what do we do? Um, what is our life about? You know, where do we go? Um, you know, now that we're saved, isn't it better for just, you know, us to die and go to heaven right away? Uh, because there we can really, you know, enjoy our time with God. You know, we're free of our burdens, we're free of everything. Um, you know, why are we still alive and going around? Um, you know, after we're saved, is God's work for me complete? You know, we're saved now, does he say, okay, you're done, I send you on your way, and then he goes and, and finds some more important stuff to work on after that. And he's got the whole universe under his control, right? Maybe he has something more important you know, after he's finished saving us. Um, you know, the thing about our God that is, I think, an amazing thing uh, is that our God is a personal God. Uh, our God doesn't just save us and leave us alone, but he chooses us, he saves us, and he really wants to be with us. He wants to fellowship with us, wants to spend time with us. Um, you know, he speaks with us. He saves us, and he grants us a life that is truly blessed with, with him. Um, and looking at today's passage, I think, you know, Philip is a good example to look at. Um, because this is the early church, and, and Philip is an individual that we can kind of relate to because, you know, he wasn't, you know, directed by Jesus directly. He wasn't one of the disciples. You know, he was following the apostles' teaching about who Christ was. And um, I think if we look at, you know, a, a passage, Acts 2.42 we really see um, the key to success in your spiritual life. It says in Acts 2.42 that, you know, all the ones that were following, all these disciples, um, they would follow the apostles' teaching. They would have fellowship together as a church body. They would have communion and reflect on the price that Christ paid on the cross. And they would pray together. You know, this is something that they did continuously. I think it's important because this kind of this kind of um, kind of key of following the teaching and, and praying together and fellowshipping together, I think this is the key to having this this imprint on us. You're continuously doing these things, and that's what Philip was doing continuously. He was receiving this training, you know, for years. He was doing this with the church, um, and we see that you know first he was raised up as a deacon. But then after the persecution of Stephen, everyone was scattered. And so he had received this training, but now he's scattered. He's on his own. And we see that the first place he goes is Samaria. And in Samaria, he's healing people. He's casting out demons. And so there's great joy in that city. And he's preaching there as well. But Samaria is in a place in the north. And as he's doing this ministry, um, we come to this passage, and it says, um, this is where God speaks to him. Um, it says in verse 26 that, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, um, I think it's important to look at how God leads us. Um, you know, God doesn't just leave us alone, but he wants to interact with man. He wants to interact with, our, with us and, and the way we're going in life. And so how does God lead? You know, where, does, where does our direction come from? Um, I think God speaks to us in mainly three ways, and we see all three of these ways in this passage. Um, the first is through angels, through the Holy Spirit, and through God's Word. Um, the first place, you know, as I shared before, in verse 26, it says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, um, this is kind of an external guide that we have. You know, the angels, they are the heralds. You know, they're the messengers of God. Um, you know, it's like, it's one of the roles as the hand of God is to, to speak to people. And we see that Throughout the scriptures, the in angels are interacting with man on God's behalf. You know, the angels speak to Abraham, to Hagar, to Lot, to Jacob, to Moses, uh, to David, to Elijah, to Zacharias, Cornelius, Mary, Joseph, you know, Peter, Philip. You know, there's so many people the angels are interacting with. Um, and you know, in Zechariah, in, in in Luke, um, the angel comes to Zacharias, and the angel that's the messenger in this case is Gabriel. He's one of the angels that is a messenger of God. And he shares with Zacharias, he says that he has been sent to speak to you and to tell you his, this good news. 
He has a good news that he wants to share. And of course, we know the story, you know, Christmas time, we go through Luke a lot of times. And they have the story of when Jesus is being born. And it says that an angel is sent to the shepherds. And the angel is sent to the shepherds, says, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. So the angels, they're relaying, you know, God's message to them. And this is the one, one of the ways, of course, that God interacts. But, you know, for us, you know, how many of you have met with an angel? <laughs> I'm guessing not too many of you. Um, but I think that today, you know, the age that we live in, um, God does have a more intimate way of speaking to us. Um, the angels, it was, it was a messenger sent either through visions or, or through, you know, ordinary looking people. These angels came. That was an external way. But I think God speaks to us a lot more intimately because he speaks to our hearts. And the next two ways I think are connected. He speaks to us through his Holy Spirit and through the Word of God. Um, through the Holy Spirit, he always anointed the prophets with the Holy Spirit. That's, where they, that's how they were able to you know, proclaim the way, tell people the way of meeting with God because they were anointed with the Holy Spirit. And it says in this passage that we went through today, in verse 29, that the Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. So first he was sent by the angel to a certain direction. And then as he's on his way, he gets a little bit more um, direct knowledge of what to do through the working of the Holy Spirit. It says, go to that chariot and stay near it. It's an internal guide for him. And we see the Holy Spirit it, it works with us, and it guides us at times. It was guiding Paul in Acts 16. It says, in Acts 16, 6, Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phygria and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. So the Holy Spirit was guiding Paul. And we see that after, you know, the time that Christ was with his disciples, he was guiding them all the way. But after he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God, he sent the Holy Spirit to be our guide. And it was in order to fulfill partly the prophecy of Joel that said that God would pour his spirit among all people. In the past, it was just the prophets, but now it's for all of those that believe. God is with us. We're sealed by the Holy Spirit, and he guides us and leads us through this intimate way. This Holy Spirit, it's our counselor, it's an advocate, it's a helper, it's a guide. It teaches us at times. And it says it reminds us of the things that Jesus said. It reminds us of scripture. So the Holy Spirit, I think it's important to keep in mind, the Holy Spirit is an intimate way of guiding us, but it always works in connection with the word. Um, in verse 35 of this passage, it says, Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. So if we look at the guidance that God is giving to Philip, you know, he starts with an angel sending him to a location. Then he's you know, guided a little bit more directly to the Holy Spirit to come and go by this chariot. But then ultimately, it's through the word of God that Christ is preached. Um, I think that's something important that we need to remember. You know, God works in this way. You know, connecting the Holy Spirit to the Word. It's also in, it says in Psalm 119, verse 105, The Word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. The Word of God directs us and guides us. Um, and it, I think it, it's cool if we look at this, and, and I was... You know, as I was meditating on this, you know, earlier, I realized that, you know, through this guidance, that God is really guiding by his trinity. Because who is it that sends the angels? It's God the Father. And who is it that was speaking to the heart of Philip? It's the Holy Spirit. And what is it that he was proclaiming? It's Christ. It's the Logos. It's the Word. And that's the Trinity right there, all at work, you know, guiding. It's an amazing thing. 
Um, but from this passage, I think it's also important to look at when does God use us? Um, you know, when do you think that you're going to be of use to God? Um, is it is it within your plan? Do you have you know a direction you're headed in life, and you're like, when I get to that place, you know, that's when God is going to use me after I'm prepared, after I'm ready with everything. You know, on our way to work, you know, we're really busy trying to get there, and and we're just headed in that direction, and. And we think that, okay, once I have some peace and I can rest at work, you know, that'll be the time maybe that God can use me. Or, or when I'm reached a point when I'm at peace with everything around me, that God will use me. I think it's cool that, you know, at this point, you know, Paul, you know, he's on his way. As he's being sent by this angel, he's on his way to where he's going. And the Holy Spirit led him to this eunuch to share Christ. But he hadn't reached his destination that the angel sent him to. Now he's in Samaria. And, you know, the road that the angel sends him to is way down south. But it says while he's on his way that he meets with the eunuch. So I think what's important for us to remember is um, the physical destination isn't as important as the spiritual one. You know, he never made it to where he was supposed to go, that final destination. It was while he was on his way that the Spirit of God really worked. And I think, I think that's something that we've got to think about because a lot of us are really concerned so much with, with where we're headed to in life that we ignore the times when God really prompts our heart um, to act along the way. You know, I had the same idea you know, I, always, I, I had a, a path set for my life. I had a plan. You know, I was going to be you know, graduate from college, be an engineer, you know, make a lot of money, <laughs> you know, give tithe and do Bible study. Um, you know, that was my goal. That was, that's what I was headed to. Um, and I thought, you know, even if I neglect some things in my life, that it's okay as long as I'm headed towards that goal. So, you know, it's okay if I skip church sometimes because, you know, my, my, my studies are really important. Or it's okay if, you know, I, I don't attend a Bible study now. Because later on, when I, I have more peace and more time, I can start a Bible study. So I thought that a lot of those things that were, you know, of spiritual importance, I could put off to a later date. When I, when, I was more, when I had more time, when I was more free, when I had reached my goal. And I thought, that's the time when God is going to use me. Um, but man, was I wrong. <laughs> You know, it's always while we're on our way that God uses us. And that's the same thing that happened to me. I was on my way, you know, God totally, he changed my life. He turned me around. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's important that we have goals, of course, in life. But I think that, you know, we don't want to neglect our relationship with God to reach that goal. we got to make time for God. You know, in prayer, and time in the Word. Even in fellowship at church with other believers. Um, so all this to say that, you know, we're so busy, you know, focused on where we're headed, that we lose hold of today. Um, you know, I'll suffer today as long as I can enjoy tomorrow. Or, you know, my happiness lies in a hope, you know, that, that's for a better tomorrow. Um, I think there are two mistakes that we make. The first is we live too much in the past. We live way too much in the past. Or, the second mistake, is we live way too much in the future. Uh, we need to live in the present day. Live for today. Now, honestly, we don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. You could die tomorrow, and then all your future plans and future dreams, they'd be for naught. You know? And living in the past, you know, a lot of times we're, we get stuck in, in our scars, in our limitations. And that really holds us back today from doing the things that we could be doing because we're so trapped in that past. It could even be past successes that we've had. You know, our glory days in high school or in college or in the past. You know, we're still living in that world of the past that we're not living for today. And some people live too much in the future. You know, they're living in a dream world where all their hopes, all their dreams are in the future and that's all they think about. You know, one of my favorite quotes 
Um, I forget where I read this, but it says, um, don't dream about something when you should be doing it. <laughs> so that was always my problem. I tend to dream a lot and, and say like my daydreams and, and think about what's going to happen, you know, later on, you know, and, and how things are going to work out. I have it planned out in my head, and when I do that, I end up not acting when I should. I'm just hoping those things are going to happen. But we really do at times. We gotta live for to, gotta live today. You know, it's a blessing. Um, you know, God, is, He's going to use you, and it's going to be when you least expect it. A lot of times. You know, for Philip, it was while he was on his way. You know, for you, you're headed somewhere. But God's going to use you on the way. You know, when you least expect it. Um, the second point I want to go through is where he is led. Where he is led is very important. It's, he's led to the Ethiopian eunuch. He's led to a person that is prepared by God, that is appointed for salvation. And all of this preparation is, of course, in God's hands. Um, in Acts 1.8, you know, it says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. Where? To the ends of the earth. Now, this is a promise. And what's cool is that, you know, during this time, a lot of the Romans and the Greeks, you know, the way they, they had the map, you know, um, drawn out and everything, so, you know, the end of the world lied in, in places like Spain. But the southern end of the world was actually, for the Romans and Greeks, uh, Ethiopia. It was that southern edge of the world. So when they actually met with the Ethiopian eunuch, they were pretty excited because it was already the fulfillment of God's word for the known world at that time. And this was really a blessing of meeting because this led to the gospel entering into Africa. How big of a door was it? You know, this place, Ethiopia, Ethiopia is a very wealthy nation. Um, they were known for iron smelting, uh, for their gold, and also for trade. And within that nation, the person that he met was a very powerful individual. He was an official in charge of all of the treasury of the queen of the Ethiopians. So he's, he, he meets with this individual you know, that, that's led by the Holy Spirit to meet with. And this individual is from a wealthy nation, and he is a very powerful, important person within that nation, in charge of all of the treasury. Now, that's an amazing thing. Um, there are people that are prepared for salvation that God will lead us to. And this is really our guarantee in regards to evangelism. When God calls us out to, to share the gospel, to be a witness, we know, we have a guarantee that there are people that are prepared to hear this, to receive life. And the Ethiopian is one example. Uh, in verse 36, we can read it, but it says, As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here's water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariots. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. So this individual was prepared to be saved. And he was excited, and he's like, why shouldn't I be baptized? Let's do it now, you know? He was having joy in his heart, and he was saved. You know, later on in Acts 10, um, you know, there's a prepared person. It's Cornelius. He's a centurion of the Italian regiment, a Roman soldier. And it says in Acts 10, 3, one day at about three in the afternoon, Peter had a vision. He had this vision to meet with Cornelius. You know, this is a person who has prepared to receive salvation. Later on in Acts 10, um, in verse 3, it says that about three... Oh, sorry, I read that verse. <laughs> uh, later on in Acts 13, uh, verse 48, in Antioch, it says, When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. So there were people that were appointed for eternal life, that they were meeting the field, that were ready to receive salvation, that these people were sent to, that they met with. Um, these people were appointed for salvation. Ephesians 1.4 says, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be a holy and blameless in his sight. Um, we were chosen you know, before the beginning of time. 
Jeremiah 1.5 says that before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. It says before he was even born, it says that God knew him. God appointed him as a prophet. If we're chosen, you know, before the world begins, is it possible for us to earn our salvation in any way? It's impossible. That's why in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift from God, not by works that no one can boast. We're appointed for salvation from the beginning of time. There's no way that we can earn our salvation. But can we lose our salvation? 2 Timothy 1, 9 says, Who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. We were chosen before the world began. So can a God who exists outside of time, who chose us before the world began, you know, can he say, oh, hey, that person's sinning again. Maybe I made a mistake. You know, he chose us, you know, before time began. There's no way that we could lose our salvation once we're chosen. Um, if it's by God's power, people are saved. The thing that we really must do is pray. You know, we just had our jam event. We need to pray for our friends, for our family, and for those around us that God has placed, you know, within our life. For them to receive salvation because it's by God's power that he'll turn their hearts to him. You know, ultimately, um, God works in this way so that he can receive all the glory. Because that's what our lives are about. You know, enjoying our fellowship with God and really glorifying him through everything. The third point for today is, um, what is he that to share? What is Philip share? And this is a message that's prepared by God. It's, of course, the good news. Um, we see the Ethiopian eunuch. Um, you know, of course, during that time, you know, the reason that Philip knows what he's reading is because a lot of times, you know, they would read the scriptures aloud. And so he's reading from Isaiah 53, um, 7 and 8. Um, you know, one of the things that he says is, as he comes to the, the Ethiopian, he says, do you understand what you are reading? And the Ethiopian replies, how can I? And then someone explains it to me. Um, a few years back when I was in Taiwan, we had an evangelism camp. And this was the passage that they went through for the camp about the Ethiopian eunuch and how people are prepared by God when we go out um, to share you know, the gospel. And it was during that time when it was kind of the, the end of camp. It was kind of coming to an end. And you know, it was like the last minute people were, were trying to find who we can talk to. And you know, I was praying a lot and I was really uncomfortable. And my friend was there with me kind of poking me <laughs> to, uh, to, to kind of share the gospel with someone. And there happened to be um, a few foreigners, like three girls, um, that were standing off in the distance, and they actually had an evangelism track in their hand um, that someone had given to them, and they were just kind of flipping through it, right? And at that moment, this, this scripture passage came to my mind, and I was really filled by the Holy Spirit. And I was like, you know, I'm going to go up to them, and, and, you know, I have nothing else on my mind except, do you understand what you are reading? Okay? <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, maybe God will fulfill this scripture just like that. <laughs> and so I, I made my way up to them. And I said, you know, they had the, the track in their hand, and they were just flipping through it, right? So I said, exactly this. I said, do you understand what you are reading? And in my mind, I'm thinking, they're going to respond, how can I? <laughs> and someone explains it to me. <laughs> but how did they respond? They responded, it's in Chinese. <laughs> of course we can't read it. I was like, oh. Okay, let me take that. And um, <laughs> that's as far as I had thought in my mind, too. I didn't know what else to say. Uh, so I actually had an English track with me. So I actually ended up giving that to them. Uh, I talked to them, but um, <laughs> yeah, it, it didn't work out how I had planned in my mind, of course. <laughs> but God works. And that's the, that's the important thing to remember. <laughs> Um, 
But through this passage, you know, God orchestrated everything. And, and Philip, he became a witness of Christ. You know, how is, you know, the, the Ethiopian eunuch says, how can I, and then someone explains it to me. <coughs> what made Philip distinct from the Ethiopian is that Philip had the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what allowed Philip to explain Christ. And not just explain Christ as a knowledge, but explain Christ as something that would penetrate his heart, where the word would enter into him. That's the difference. And the passage that he went through, um, Isaiah 53, it says, you know, he was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its share is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. You know, looking at this passage, we see that, you know, who is this, this, this lamb? Who is this sheep that's led to the slaughter? It's Christ. You know? In the past, they had the Passover. And it's through the blood of the lamb that they were freed from Egypt, that they received their salvation. Um, through the Exodus. You know, and throughout the time when they were wandering in the desert after that, it was through continuous sacrifi sacrifice, ah, I can't say <laughs> sacrifices <laughs> that they were making. You know, these unblemished lambs that they were giving up, shedding his blood. And when John the Baptist first sees Jesus, what does he say? He says, Here comes the Lamb of God. You know, this is the Lamb of God. Because that's what Jesus is. He is this lamb that Isaiah is talking about. And he didn't open his mouth. Why? Because he was obedient to his father's will. You know, there's a time when, when Jesus prays before his father. He says, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not by my will, but yours be done. So he knew he was going to suffer. He knew it was ahead of him. And yet, it was all about his father's will being perfectly obedient. And of course he was deprived of justice because he was sinless and he took upon himself the sin of the world. He paid our price to reconcile us to God. And he died. He was taken from the earth and he resurrected. And that's where Philip shares the good news. What is the good news? That this Jesus who died for our sins, this Lamb of God, he rose again. He rose again, and through faith in him, we too can have eternal life. You know, this is our Savior, Jesus. He defeated the work of the devil. Jesus is our Lord, and if we believe, we can have eternal life. And if this is the same message that we're sharing today. You know, that Jesus is the Christ, that he defeated the work of Satan, this Lamb of God. Uh, in conclusion, looking at the, the passage overall, how is Philip led? He's led, of course, by God. You know, and God, you know, speaks at times through angels, but more so today through the Holy Spirit and through His Word, through the Scriptures. Where is He led? On His way. He's led to a prepared person, someone that is prepared by God to receive salvation. And what does He share? He shares Christ. This is the message that God gave us, that entrusted to us this mystery that the world does not know. The mystery of the gospel that allows us to be reconciled with God. So what we really need to realize today is, you know, how do we live our lives? Ultimately, um, this time that Philip had, it was a time of Emmanuel. It was really God being with him. You know, the guiding in his life. You know, the meeting with a prepared person, the sharing the message of Christ. You know, it was all in connection with God. He didn't do anything alone. It was nothing by his power, but all by God's. And I think there's some things that we can apply to our lives today through this passage. Um, the first thing is that we really need to have our ears open to hear the Holy Spirit's guidance. Um, and I think we do this through prayer through the Word of God. Word and the prayer. Um, you know, this was the training that, that Philip had received, you know. He received the teaching from the apostles. He received the Word. 
They were constantly in fellowship and communion and in prayer. And this is what we need to do today, you know, each and every day. You know, have that time of word and prayer, your devotional time with God. The second thing um, we need to do is not get stuck in the past and not get stuck too much in the future. Realize the importance of today. You know, it was while he was on his way that God used him. It was in that moment, today. It might even be today, right when you leave here. You know, God might use you. You never know when it's going to happen. Realize the importance of today. And thirdly, there are prepared people to receive salvation. Um, but are you prepared to share it with them? That's the question. Um, you know, Philip, he had this opportunity to share the gospel with the Ethiopian eunuch. But he could have been like, oh no, you know, the, the angel sent me to this place. Maybe I should keep going and pass this guy by. Uh, you know, or he could have taught him something else. He could have taught him the law or, or just told him, you know, you know, why don't you just go to the synagogue? Uh, but he took the time to share the gospel with him. So I think that every day you should be prepared to share that gospel message. You know, go through it yourself, you know, in the morning or find time. And don't just go through it as a knowledge. You know, but really try to find yourself in that message. So it's not just, you know, some words that are, you know, just some words that you're reading off, but let it be your witness to them. Let it come from your heart when you share it. Um, at the end of this passage, we didn't read it, but in verse 39, after he shared Christ, the Ethiopian was baptized. And it says, When he came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. And this is really... Um, what we gain in life, you know, this joy. Um, you know, the Ethiopian eunuch was left rejoicing. He was so happy that he had received this gift of salvation. And that's what you got to think of when you're out there. You know, there are people that are prepared. They're going through difficult times. They're struggling. Um, and they're just waiting to hear this message. And when you hear it, when they hear it, joy is what enters. You know, it's the joy of Christ. It's the joy of being reconciled with God. You know, all of your burden is taken away. And you just enjoy your fellowship with God. So I want to leave you today with one of my favorite verses, Philippians 4, verses 4 to 7. I like this. Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. He emphasizes that. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That's what I want to leave you with this week. Rejoice in the Lord always. I pray that as you live your, your walk of faith, as you live your life, that you will be guided by God, that you will seek out those prepared people that you will live your life according to the message that Christ is your all in all. That he is your greatest joy in life. Amen. Let us pray at this time. Um,